I have very deep roots in Ontario. Why and where? Where do you think they are? I have the Century Farm that I visit occasionally out here. I'll drive out to it, have a wonderful overnight, not giving you a clue there, not too close here. Peterborough. My father was born in Lakefield, Ontario. Oh, how many know where Lakefield oh, yeah. is? <laughs> and how many have heard of this name? I love this name, Schmong Lake. Yeah. Who knows where Schmong yeah. Lake is? Good for you. It's a lovely <laughs> little know. lake right beside <laughs> or in Bridge North. Bridge North is a charming little Ontario town with all those lovely old stone houses and it's a very old um, village and that's where my great grandparents had the marina which was the um, for wood when, uh, when people burned wood and all that that was kind of where the wood was brought in on the lake and so the bluets so these are the names from Ontario bluet drain Boyce, which was my maiden name, uh, Miles, those are the four major names of my family. And anyway, just for the fun of it, I brought a couple of pictures. And um, these are the two lines. These are my mother's line and my father's. Now, I've told you that my father has come from Lakefield. Mother's family are from um, Lincolnshire, England. So that is up on the east side of the Middle England, you might, up the M11, you might know where that mm -hmm. is, Janet, out of, out of London, and it's straight, it's about, I'd say, 100 miles north of London, and uh, that's where Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote Crossing the Bar. Maybe if you, many of you like poetry, and I think you do, Janet, <laughs> because you cited some lovely poetry, and of course, um, uh, he was a famous poet, um, up in, in Lincoln, and uh, out in front of Lincoln Cathedral, you can see his bust along with his dog. He liked dogs. All right, so here we've got my mother's family in England. Granddad came from a family of 18. He was number 14, and my great-grandfather, they had a business in seeds, seeds and greenhouses in, in Lincolnshire, England. And so the business always went to the older sons, and granddad was number 14. <laughs> so Uncle Ezra, Nehemiah, and the older brothers worked into the business, and at that time, back in 1903, Canada was really urging people to come out, move out, move out to the West. Land is reasonable and cheap. So granddad and his two bachelor brothers, Uncle Percy and Ernest, along with my grandma, in 1903, sailed out of, um, out, I think it was, I'm not sure, the south of England somewhere, and they landed in St. John, New Brunswick, and um, how many have been to St. John, New Brunswick? It's a pretty high hill at, at uh, Prince Arthur, right? Now, Main Street, you go straight up. <laughs> I know I've been there, and I spent all day in the warehouse district, the time I was there on the cruise ship, and I was looking at all the dates in those old brownstone brick, and anything before 1903, that was there when they got there. Mm. And so that's what was down in that area. Anyway, Fanny was an only daughter, Grandma Fanny and Grandpa Coleman from uh, Bridge North. And one thing I discovered when I went out there, when I first came here, I went to Old Gilmore Baptist Church. And looking on the wall, I was reading the, the citations of charter membership. And didn't I notice my great-grandparents' names on that list? Ooh. Gilmore Baptist. So guess what? I've got some Baptists in the background. <laughs> now, jumping into my own life, and I'm all over the board. This isn't what I wrote, believe me. Um, <laughs> uh, I want to say this. This is a question I want to ask. How many of you have had a strong, godly influence in your early life, mm -hmm. early life. How many? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You know what? That's a sheer gift from the Lord, to have that godly influence when you're young. Mm -hmm. But now I want to say this, how many of you, and we don't need to put our hands up, those of you ladies that have, haven't had that godly mom that taught you to pray beside your bed, and you didn't have a godly father, but you were brought up and it was hard. 
I want to say to you, you know what? God reached down and touched you, all of you who are in that camp. And know this, God wants you to be that woman to whoever it is you're being it to. Your children, your grandchildren, whoever, you be that woman. And it's a wonderful thing that you were chosen. Just think about that. And that's one thing that I grapple with in my mind. And I say, Lord, why, did I, why do I believe when so many people I like do not believe in Christ? And you know, they're nice people. You like them. You say, how can I reach them? Their hearts seem so, I don't want to use the word hard, but that's almost what I want to say. How do we reach them? So how is it that I believe? I remember when I was sitting in a graduate class, studying for a master's, and, and we were all sitting around this table at the University of Alberta. And so one day, Dr. Birch said, I want each of you people to come in and review a book you've read. So I thought, yeah, God, you've got a sense of humor. <laughs> and so guess what? I went in, and I want to tell all of you this. If you ever want a quick thumbnail sketch of the Bible, of God's plan of salvation, that you can read one chapter and you'll find it all there. You know where that is? Colossians. The first chapter of Colossians, you'll see where creation is touched. Jesus said, I was there at the beginning and created. It's a marvelous chapter. And so I presented that to a very atheistic group. And it was, it was challenging. But at the very end, it was even more, it, it was interesting. Dr. Birch said, has anyone got a question for Beverly? <laughs> With silent as a great. Nobody asked. And I've often wondered how many took that home and actually read it again? How many thought about it? And I've asked the pastor here, I said, listen, I grapple this with this divine question. Why are we believers? Are we chosen? Are others not? And yet God said not, he's not willing anybody perishes. I don't know, that's just something. I thank the Lord for my belief so often. Why do I believe? And you know what? When you believe, be so thankful. That is a real wonderful thing because so many don't. Yeah? All right. So, born in Saskatchewan. Um, now then, I've, I wanted to say something about my mother's family. Land out in Alberta, back there at the turn of the century, was... $10 a, um, a, a section, and a section is 620 miles. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. block of land, mm -hmm. and I would say that from my agricultural background, which I'm so grateful for, I loved it, um, that farming, Alberta right now, they're really crying the blues out there. I've got all my friends say, Bev, you have no idea. Albert is in the toilet. We've got problems. We don't know what's going to happen. Oil and gas is gone. And I said, listen, listen, you guys. Farming is still the main industry in Alberta. The three prairie provinces are the grain of the world. We can't forget that. Get back to the farm. Start growing all kinds to eat. You can't eat oil, but you can eat bread. You can eat all that stuff. And so, just to touch on the farm, I still have half of it. It's my inheritance that came down from Grandpa Coleman, from Lakefield, to my father, to myself and my brother. And I've told my children, I said, whatever you do, the stock market is crashing. Erin called me late last night. She said, Mom, what am I going to I said, you know what? Do you love the Lord? Yeah. Well, I said, that's all you need. Don't worry about the money. I'm not worrying about mine, it's going, and who knows? But God is still in charge for all of us. And I'm not going to forget that. And if I have any kind of a testimony tonight, it's to tell you people, to, moving forward, to hang on. We've got something that's so precious, so vital, eternity. And that's a lot, a lot to say. And all the stock market and all that stuff. And yeah, I, I've got to admit, I'm in it. I have all my money invested in Lloydminster and out in Scotia. And I'm not worried about it. It's whatever happens will happen, you know, and we can't. Now, gifts from our parents. You know, 
in this gene pool, we've all come out with something pretty nice. And from my mother, you've touched on it, Lorraine. I sat at the piano with the old coal oil lamp up on our piano, trying to shine down on Sigmund, Mer Sing Sigmund Romberg, Victor Herbert, Franz Lehar, and mother would play these beautiful melodies. And even out in that primitive culture in Clear Range, I was singing these beautiful melodies under coal oil lamps, just because my mother knew how to do it. And granddad was the one that sort of made sure that she got that training as a small child. And they were from England. They were very conscious of aesthetics, which I think you are, Jack. You love the beautiful flowers and all that, like your daughter's name being a butterfly, which speaks to tonight. And from my dad, I learned how to herd cattle, ride horseback. And Lorraine touched on my horseback riding. Well, I don't think we could afford a saddle back there. And I learned to ride bareback. And boy, and when it was minus 25, Dandy's hair was that long. And I must tell you, the warmth in his body was lovely, even through my ski pads. But I've got to say this. The hardest, one of the hardest times in my life was 1948. I was born in 1940, remember? So I'm eight years old. So we've had all of this great life on the farm, Dandy, my beautiful horse, kittens in the barn and in the house, all of the pets, the cows. And all of a sudden, Mother said, you know, and she talked my dad into it. She had her teaching. Mother was a teacher. And my dad had grade nine. He, got, he was caught in the cracks in that move from Peterborough. The oldest brother went through and became a gynecologist. He said, I'm not picking rock and stone on this farm. So he went off to Edmonton and went through medicine. And dad was the youngest with grade nine. And so he became a farmer, but a very good one and a very good man. So he taught me riding horseback, herding cattle. And one of the saddest things in my life was one time coming back with a, pick, a getting the cattle for milking at night, and a lovely old cob called Blossom was bloated and dead on the, on the trail. And that was her little bell, and she had been a wedding gift to mom and dad from grandma and granddad Duckring in 1933. And Blossom in the 1940s was still alive, and a very good milk cow, and their gift were two milk cows, and Blossom was one of them. Mm -hmm. So I kept her little bell. It was such a beautiful thing to have. Mm -hmm. And um, so from my dad, the love of the farm, the animals, and riding. And I'll never, I, I don't play golf, but I'm not a bad horseback rider. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, I want to say something else my dad did that's had long-reaching yeah enjoyment for me and still does. And Lorraine, you're a witness to this. Swing. My dad built me a beautiful swing out in the bush behind the farmhouse. And I remember spending many, many hours looking at the big Alberta sky and daydreaming on my swing. But you know, a swing is a, mar a marvelous piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Here in Grimsby, down at the play at, at the school, it's what Grand Avenue School. There's a lovely big swing. And have, have you ever seen me go up on the swing, Lorraine? <laughs> right like that. Woo. The whole thing. I still do. And you know what? 80 coming up in July, I still plan to sit on the swing. Now, what is the value of a swing? Because this is really, you guys could all do this. And I've got to tell you, it would be great for your ma major, your core. Right in the core. And you, what you do, you sit on the swing. Don't move your feet, but start moving. Start sitting quiet, like you're sitting there, just sitting. Start doing this, pulling on the rope. And you know you're gonna start doing this. This is the side lunge. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon you're gonna really get that fulcrum moving. And fulcrum, right? <laughs> anyway, and you know, I just think a swing is so cheap, but it's probably the best builder of the tribe, uh, all, your, uh, all this. And it's so good for your lungs, get the oxygen going. And I think if you're recuperating from anything, just go out there and do, say, 10 pulls. Sit on the swing, do 10, just 10. Then build it, start adding on. 
And I actually think, because I do this, and I'll tell you, my breathing, that's one thing. I have a weakness in the lung. I've had allergies and borderline asthma, and I have to be careful. I go to see Dr. Lau. He's a good doctor. He's one I really like out here. And uh, so he kind of keeps an eye on me. I've had CAT scans, and he said the last, wow, there's nothing wrong with you. And I said, hey, that's good news. It must be the way. He thinks I'm sort of a funny one, but he, you know, I, he is too. He is too. So anyway, so I just want to tell you that little tip. Riding a swing is cheap, and it pays off. It's so good for you physically. OK, um, now. The move to Edmonton. So what happens to a little queen bee when I've ridden old dandy to a, oh, by the way, Lorraine never answered the question. Where do the horses go on? <laughs> All right, the way those schoolyards were set up in the prairie, there were 16 uh, acre plots. So you had the little one room schoolhouse with two cloak rooms at the back, a toilet, a big shed for all the coal for the big pot belly stove in the school, and a barn. The barn was for all the horses. And kids came in sleighs in the winter with the horse drawn, and I rode, like Glenn and I rode, you know, horseback. That was the easiest, because single horse, no, no sleighs, no wagons, it was easy. So, um, all right, so mom had always prayed she wanted to get to a church. Mother came, I would say, when we look back in our family heritage, and one of my great grandmother's name was Keziah Rebecca. Now, how many know where Keziah is from? Okay, Old Testament, book of Job. Job had three daughters, Jemima, Keziah, and Kieran. Kieran Havoc. But isn't Kieran pretty? pretty I get, my daughter's Aaron. That's pretty close to Kieran. And I thought, you know, Job had... Pretty nice names there. So when you look at my great grandma, Keziah Rebecca, her daughter Rosetta was my mother's mother. She was my grandma. Grandma Rosetta was the champion. She brought Jesus over the Atlantic for our family. So how did how did the Lord get into if that was the duck rings, The English. The English brought Christ with them when they came. The voices, now they started well. But I'll tell you, when you look back at your life, there's some tragedies, there's some hardships. So I was going to mention the 48. Mother's prayer was to move to the church, so we moved to Edmonton from the farm. Now, if you don't think that's a major thing, a rites of passage for someone to move at a young age from one culture to another inside the same province, it's like moving to a new country. And I'll tell you, I faced rejection. That's one of the hardest human behaviors you'll ever face. If you've ever faced rejection, that's tragic. That's untouchable almost. Well, that's the way I felt when I went into that elementary class in Cromdale School. And I'll never forget it. Where I was a little queen bee out in the farm school, one of 12 kids, the youngest, and all the older girls would take my, my snow pants off, big rubber boots, uh, parka, and I was just treated so well. I get to the city, I'm one of 30 kids, or what it was, and boy, you're the ugliest kid in your room, you're dumb, and just every, <coughs> every abuse you could imagine. The mental abuse was horrific. And I remember crying and thinking, I hate this life. Why did we come to the city? And my mother, of course, she got on teaching with the, with the Edmonton public, very lucky. And my dad, he had to catch his cab. Very low laboring jobs that brought him into some very um, dark situations. It wasn't nice. He had a hard time. So when I think now as an adult, I can only think as a child. I hate this life. I hate the kids at school. I don't, I want to go back to the farm. Where's Dandy? Where's Ginny? Where's all my pets? This is horrible. Anyway, by and by, there was a savior that came, Christ himself, but he was always there. The Nazarene Church. We started going to the Nazarene Church. Well, 
My father was saved, my brother and myself. We went to the altar and accepted Christ. Kind of, we, I always, just like you said, Janet, you've always known Christ. You've always, all your life, I feel that way about myself. You know, with my mom praying that little simple prayer back in the farmhouse. And I don't know how many of you ever said this little prayer. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child. Pity my simplicity and give me grace to come to thee. And then God bless mommy and daddy and all the animals and everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, that was the way that went. Well, I used to do that. And um, so anyway, going to the Nazarene church, I would say that the Nazarene church shaped my whole Christianity as a young girl. We never drank. And I'm so thankful now. I never got into that world of watching people lose their dignity and whatever through alcohol. I was kept away from smoking, which another thing saved a lot of money, I guess. But it sort of was a wonderful thing. But I've got to tell you this. If I sound like Goody Two Shoes, it's not true altogether. I got caught in the tender trap. I fell in love with a really great guy, my husband. And anyway, one thing leads to another, and you dabble in things, and I'm all woman, I'm sorry, and he was all guy. So I got pregnant before we were married. Well, I want to tell you, that brought down the most the judgment, and I remember my aunt just looking at me, and she said, I never thought you, you know, and oh my. And I really have never, even to this day, I don't think some of them have ever got over the fact that I lowered the bar there. But you know what? Oh, God, I thank God. Well, I have a lovely son, Patrick. He's going to be 50 this year. He was our ch child that was born December 29th, and um, anyway, he's a wonderful Christian, lives in Calgary, works with Preston Manning. He did all Preston Mannings. We all love math. I think I told you that, Diane. Our family likes math, and you know, I could go on, but it's 9 o'clock. I wanted to say that God is, you know, the Bible is such a wonderful book, and one of the finest things I've done in my life is read through the Bible a few times, and it's right out of this province. How many of you have heard of Quick Study? On Vision TV. Comes on 7 o'clock in the morning, Rod Hambry and Janet and their children, and it's out of Orangeville. I've watched that program out in Alberta since 1998, and it's still on. This is their 30th year, actually. And anyway, that's how I read through the Bible, because it's a half-hour segment. I tape it on my PVR, pull up the... At noon, I'll make my signature soup with sardines, Lorraine. <laughs> I make a sardine soup, because listen, ladies, sardines, high, high, high nutrition, they're antioxidants, lots of calcium, but moreover, <laughs> protein, calcium. Well, I mean, women need calcium. <laughs> Sardines, and boy, with your stocking, pulling stuff out to, for a two-week, whatever you're going to have at home, pull out some sardines for their... Honestly, I can't push that enough. And I, I tell you a secret, I absolutely hate them. But I, I do, but I make a soup with um, sardines, and I mask it with turmeric. Now, turmeric's got a lot of... Very good quality. You should be getting turmeric and all this good stuff. Martha, pay attention. That's good for you too. And so anyway, Lois um, uh, is always adding out good recipes. I'm going to have to give you my sardine soup. Just, just one last thing I want to say because the time is fine and I have so much to tell you. Uh, yeah, good for you. You've got a real good sense of humor. Um, uh, what I want to say 
is that um, going forward, you know, we're all looking forward to that blessed hope of Christ. Now, I don't know where you people are with your beliefs and whatnot, but this is what I want to say. Israel is huge. I don't know how many of you people realize that God's promises through Isaiah, Nehemiah, Daniel, wow, the book of Daniel, Jeremiah, and then all the eight minor prophets, Nam and Joel and all of them, they all have the same message, that Jesus is coming back. And where is he coming back? The Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Now I know that unless you people kind of get into your Bible, and why did I make, why did I get pick up a life of 74 years out in that prairie, and I can show you, I brought a whole bunch of pictures. One thing I should have shown you before I go too much, you know, before and after is always fun, right? Here's my wedding picture to my beautiful Irish husband, and there's our 40th anniversary, <laughs> before and after. And you can look at them after. I brought up pictures of our family, and I've got five granddaughters, no grandsons, but... What I want to do, take this, Diane, feel this, start passing this around. Now, what is, what's coming around, and I want all of you to hold that. Back in 2000, and you know, I didn't get to all the gifts that God has given me in my life, but this is you. I'm going to jump to the big stuff. Went to Israel for the big millennial church service, Easter Sunday service, in the garden too. Now, how many have been to Israel here? Oh, bless your heart. So you know where the garden tomb is. So we went for the millennial Easter Sunday service. Mom was 92. Erin was at the London School of Economics, and she went British Airways. Uh, and we all actually, we, we, oh, it was a terrible storm. It was a blizzard out of Calgary when we were going to Israel. And little fat Gertrude, Mom's best friend, because we got that line, that's mine. And she was 88, Mom was 92, and I'm with these two, darling. I thought they were good. Oh, honestly, they were. And so we went, we got to England overnight, and um, so it's 11 o'clock at Heathrow. And Gertrude says, oh, I wish I could lay down, because British Airways wasn't leaving till 11 at night for, he for uh, Tel Aviv. So they had all day. So... Gertrude said, and I said, listen, Gertrude, I don't have any special uh, cards to get into the VIP lounges. I have nothing, but I can speak. So we got <laughs> Gertrude into laying down on the couch all day. And so mom, mom was pretty wise. She said, what are you doing? And I said, mom, I haven't come over the Atlantic all night in a blizzard out of Calgary to sit around an airport. I'm going down to Harrods. You know what I mean? <laughs> so anyway, so she looked at me and says, can I come with you? And I said, oh, absolutely not. You come. You're welcome. So dear little mom, she was a sport. I, by, by the way, um, when I went back to university to do that, I did that thing for IBM, and I learned the computer, IBM. And I wrote a, I did a 